Warning, the radio broadcast you're about to hear was made by men and for men. It may at times seem a little rough around the edges, brash, and certainly not canonically approved by papal authority. But its content may indeed challenge you to become the man, father, husband God has called you to be. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to The Obligation, where we discuss topics in faith and in life to help you become the man God called you to be. Let's get started. Jason Murphy, another week of the obligation is here. Are you ready to roll? Let's rock and roll, John Eads. I'm ready to go. Well, we've got all we got a we got a hosh posh of ideas to cover <laughs> today. As as we we get to Mother's Day, it, it's yeah. Mother's Day. It's the celebration of mothers. Uh, what's the first thought that comes to mind for you when you think about your mother or your wife? Oh, wow. You know, it creeps up on us, I think, you know, as guys we're running and going and hopefully we've had some ideas in our head of what we're going to do and and make that day special for our our moms, our wives or both or one or the other. Um, You know, it's just when you really stop and slow down and look at what they do. Um, I look at, you know, what my mom, you know, has done for me, you know, uh, I wouldn't be where I am without my mom, you know, holding me to a higher standard. And I think, you know, that's, that's where our wives are. I think they hold us in check and and hold us to a a higher standard. And that, that affects, you know, how we raise our kids and, and what type of parents we are and fathers and husbands. And that's our goal. So, um, I think that a lot more attention probably, I mean, it's certainly a, big event you know you, we hear about it on on the on the tv and on the news a lot of mother's day mother's day you know a month ago um because it is it is a it is a big event that we really need to take time and appreciate those women in our lives who are mothers uh or even in a motherly capacity you know that may not be our our relative mothers but you know people who have stood by us and helped us get to where we you know needed to be so it's an important day for sure how about you hey, i think i think to marry a lot when I think the Mother's Day and just thinking of her journey from one saying yes to to raising the Son of God. And it, it's just a, a phenomenal example of what motherhood and how important it is. And when in those moments where a human being was needed most. She was always there. Mm-hmm. And, and I think motherhood today is overlooked in our society. And I don't know if it's just from the blend of the society telling us that our roles don't matter, that, you know, the m- moms in the workplace, not in the workplace, dad's not in the workplace, dad's in the workplace. It feels like there's just, there should be no roles anymore. Yeah. And I can just say in my personal experience, there's nothing like a mother's love and both in with my own mom and then seeing the way my children interact with their mother, uh, my wife. And I just want to stop for a moment and say thank you to all the mothers out there, whether you still have a phenomenal relationship with your kids or not, you played an enormous role in the history of the world and in God's kingdom and it's just it's you're you're undervalued most days, and I hate that. And I do it myself, arms raised, you know, mm-hmm. of overlooking my mom at times. But I bring this up one because of the day, but I also bring it up because there there's if there's one person in your life, if they're a, a, a good mother, there's a good chance that they are the only person that if everything went wrong in your life that would still be there for you. Now think about that for a second. God forbid something happens in your marriage or with your children. Like I always feel like my mom would be there. And, and I, I think for any mother out there or that anyone's had to rely on their mother at times, that's a, that's just a, a motherly instinct that dads, most of us just don't have. And I I don't want to overlook it. Yeah, it's certainly a special calling and a, and a mother's love and presence to kids. Uh, yeah, I, you know, we ask the kids sometimes, well, who do you want to put you to bed? And, you know, mom, 
mom, mom is the <laughs> mom is usually the most popular, you know, dad's getting a little, little popular sometimes with the girls. I've been, you know, getting back to some of the crisscross applesauce and some variations that I've come up with. And I think they just like having their back tickled and stuff. So, but that's all right. I got to work my way in however and get it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, more times than not, you know, who do you want to take care of that little cut you got? Where's mom? I want my mom. First thing out of their mouth, mommy, you know, uh, when they get hurt, um, you know, so it, it, it is obviously a super important uh, position that they have and, and such a great respect we have for them. And this month, I'm glad you brought up Our Lady because, you know, the month of May is is dedicated to Our Lady and, uh, you know, the May crowning takes place soon. And I think well, another, you know, let's, you know, congratulate our boys. Like, I, I think your boy uh, had his first communion, right? Was that? Uh, it's It's next weekend and we okay. are... We are grinding, getting ready for it. Uh, we are. We continue to kind of navigate the "I am the bread of life" and what that means. And we were actually. It was funny. We were at dinner with some friends last night for for Amy's birthday. And Amy mentions to our good friends who are not Catholic. She says we have John Ellis's first communion coming up, and it's a big deal. And they were like, "What do you What do you mean it's a big deal? Like what What it We're not." They, they were just unfamiliar with it at being non-Catholic. And we've been friends with this couple for years and years, Jason. Like just our kids play golf together. They're the same age. And it was the first time we really got a chance to talk about our faith hmm. and talk about the importance of the sacraments in our faith. And while I wasn't in some like full bore conversion mode or – evangelization mode with them it was it just goes to show you that even events in our kids life can be opportunities for us to demonstrate our faith to someone else that might not ever experience or see it and yeah just in simply living our faith in the simple that's right of our faith you know and yeah, being, willing to, being willing to talk about it you know right. i mean by the time we got to the end of the dinner the dad was like, man, I just don't have a group of men that I'm surrounded with to talk about this kind of stuff. Some of the things we've talked about tonight. Yeah. And I'm like, again, I don't, I don't, his faith walk might be great. I don't know it as much, but it just goes to show you if you're patient and you don't have to ram that, that, that message down their, their throat there, there will be opportunities to talk about it or to, to expose it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mentioned, you know, our, our middle Joel, he had his first communion on May 1st. So that was special. So shout out there to Joel and, and of course to, uh, to young, young John, uh, coming up too. So, um, great day, you know, it is, it, you know, all these little moments of our, our faith, you know, obviously we have to be living them to be able to talk about them. You know, if we're not living them and they aren't important to us, then they're obviously not going to be important to anyone else. So, having those, uh, you know, opportunities. And, and I get those opportunities too, just even when, you know, it might come up of, you know, if I have kids or how many kids, you know, and sometimes it can just be played off. Well, oh yes, we have six kids or sometimes as well, you know, yeah, it's a blessing. We have six kids and, you know, yes, I am Catholic and here's why, you know, and here, you know, and it could always lead to conversation. So, I mean, we have to, you know, take a look at those and, and look at the opportunities and, uh, make sure we're, you know, we're not just pushing them to the side and, and we are, you know, taking pride, uh, a healthy pride, you know, in our, uh, in our faith. It's so. a, it's a significant event, uh, for both my son and your son and all, and all of our kids that we're raising them in that light. But I was at a Bible study this morning, Jason, and, we we're going through Daniel, uh, continuing to go through Daniel and, you know, the lion's den. And we get to all these points and we get to the end of Daniel chapter four. And again, I'm the only Catholic in the room just to, to refresh our listeners. And there's probably 50 or 60 guys. And so the, the, the Bible study goes to this idea of a revival, of revival in America and how important revival is in people's lives and how America needs it now more than ever. And how, you know, China Christianity and India Christianity, but in America we're struggling mm. uh, to say the least. And, and the whole idea was that we need revival here. And he starts going through all these examples 
of Protestants throughout time, uh, particularly in early American in the early American uh, history. And I started thinking, I'm like, what a missed opportunity by the Catholic Church. That's the only place my mind could go because you have all these like, I mean, Christians with with their souls on fire for Christ. And I only can imagine back in the day with like priests and cardinals and bishops and the hierarchy of the church and and men falling in love with power or the position or their authority more than having people's heart on fire for Christ. And it was just one of these moments as a Catholic, I was sitting there, Jason, and I was like, if they, if they, if they had the power of the sacraments, like we're talking about with John Ellis and, and young Joel, and that we get to experience every single week alongside their, their fire for Christ. I mean, and I was like, man, I don't even know how I would start the Catholic conversation in this room. But uh, it, what your first thoughts to that? Yeah, I mean, us Catholics, I guess we have just haven't had to struggle. I, I, I don't know what it is. I know, you know, the church, you know, changed a lot of things in the 60s. It uh, it became more of a modern uh, entity. You know, it wanted to keep up with with political concepts and, you know, things, societies dictating. And so they, you know, things changed, the mass changed, uh, guidelines changed. And I mean, we, we see a huge decrease, uh, across the board, uh, from the seventies to the two thousands, you know, in mass attendance and in vocations to the priesthood, um, even more so vocations to other, um, you know, other, other positions as far, you know, for um, nuns and, and brothers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those are all non-existent anymore. Um, monasteries shut down and, um, you know, things have just, you know, just continued to decline. Um, it, it seems like, you know, maybe towards the, the early 2000s, things maybe started to take a rebound. Um, you know, Pope Benedict, you know, revised the Missal to be more reflective of the true Latin trans translation, which had been watered down in the 1970s and, and 60s. Um, and so it seemed like there was there was more of a bounce, you know, more of a return to reverency. Uh, of course, you know, being in, in Charlotte, in the Diocese of Charlotte, which is, you know, really one of the strongest dioceses, you know, I've been, you know, throughout the country and seen different, different dioceses. And uh, we certainly are one of the most you know, orthodox, I would say, you know, you know, as far as a thriving and, and, and holding true to liturgical norms, uh, that are recommended and, and just the music we have. And it's just, there's so many, you know, there's so many, so much topic to talk about as far as like where the church went in the sixties and seventies and where it is now, but even more so now that COVID, I mean, uh, you know, we've gone from maybe close to 60% mass attendance to less than 40% mass attendance and decreasing. And so there's a big controversy and, and conversation going on now about, you know, do the bishops need to go ahead and reinstitute the obligation? Um, you know, what's that going to lead to? Is that going to just further push or is it going to, you know, is that going to call some people back? I mean, uh, it's, it's, a there's a lot, you know, um, but us as Catholics, we have to be more active. We have to be, you know, more thankful and, and more practicing of our faith. And I, I don't know what the, what the catch is, it's, it's, it obviously boils down initially, you got to have a conversation and relationship with God, and it's going to start with prayer. We've always said that, uh, from there, you know, the church has to be, has to be there as well. It's priests have to be, you know, there and, and, and relatable and accessible. So, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a huge topic. Uh, you know, it, there's a topic that we have not yet covered on the show that I think is important to cover because even within the church, there, there is a divide. There's a divide between the more traditional, um, going back to the Latin roots, uh, you could say more conservative arm of the church. And then you could almost like the political system in some ways, maybe not as extreme, mm -hmm. uh, but you certainly have the more liberal end of the spectrum of Catholics. Then you have the more conservative ends of the, of, of the spectrum in Catholics. And when you just look at the Diocese of Charlotte specifically, 
you have St. Anne's and you have St. Patrick's that tend to be more on the conservative, more traditional side, kneelers, uh, Latin mass going on, uh, veils, the women wearing veils. And then you go to the other side of town in the same city. You have a St. Matthew's that's that's much further left. You have a, um, a St. Gabriel's that's more in the middle of the road. You have a St. Vincent that's more on the traditional side. So as you start to look at the... The, the just the churches in Charlotte, you see this spread there. Now, yeah. for those listening to this, I don't know where they fall on that continuum. You know, for me being 40, growing up post Vatican II, I only really have known one Catholic church until my brother, who is much more traditional and Latin mass and obviously a priest. So it's like, I've learned so much more about that. And you see the churches that have the Latin masses, the attendance to the Latin mass is going up. People, people are more drawn to it. Whereas, but is age come into that? I mean, where do we have that conversation in the church today? Because do you look down on a St. Matthew's or the people that go to church there? Or do I, do I turn my nose up to someone that goes, to St. Anne's and where's the veil? I mean, where do you sit on that and how do you think about it? I mean, I have from, you know, some pretty strong opinions. Uh, I, I found my faith through the Latin mass as well. I went through Latin traditional seminary. Uh, you know, that was my formation. I wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation if I wouldn't have, because where I was and the churches that I knew growing up and in my teens and twenties did not provide anything that was unique and different from what I considered Protestant and just kind of, you know, something you did on Sundays. So I'm, I'm thankful. And I, I definitely am very appreciative that I did find the Latin mass. Now I don't attend the Latin mass now. Um, I think I've, you know, I've grown and kind of understood the church magisterium and the, and the, you know, practicing norms of, of the Roman rite the way it is now. Uh, do I think the Latin mass is a, is a more, you know, is it, a, it's, it's certainly a more beautiful mass in my opinion. Um, is everyone called to that or are they going to feel that? No, of course not. Um, but I think it's just, there's more of a reverency there. You can see it in everything and everything and all the different aspects of it. There's just a more reverent way to do it. Um, you know, the church is highly criticized because of the 1950s, you know, when the, you know, all you hear is about the rigidity of the church and the nuns with their rulers whacking and you, you know, everyone was in a suit and you, you know, you better genuflect and go right into the pew and all this and that. But the other side of that is the, tr the highest mass attendance was in the 1950s that we ever had. So, so there is an argument and people say, well, they did it because they were required to do it and they just were following through. And well, uh, I don't know. So now we, we have a system, a church kind of that is very reflective of the Protestants. Now the core elements hopefully, you know, and, and I would say, yes, are still there, you know, we, the sacrament itself, but this goes back to my conversation before where, you know, before while I've been to masses where I just went for the Eucharist and I just closed my eyes and had the blinders on for the rest of the mass because it was so poorly displayed. And that's not the answer either, because the mass is a whole unit. You know, we're, we are going there to receive our Lord, but we're also going there to hear the word and to pray and to be a part of this whole package of the, that the liturgical experience is. So, you know, when you have all these splintering divisions now, like you mentioned, you know, St. Matthew's is doing it one way. You're going to have live, more lively. There's probably going to be drums, guitars, all this stuff. You're going to go to St. Patrick's. It's going to be, you know, more of Latin chant and there's going to be an organ or you're going to St. Anne's and it's going to, you know, you're going to have the opportunity for Latin mass. But then the, you know, the Roman Rite mass as well is going to be presented in a very, uh, you know, uh, reverent Rever way. Yeah. So... So I don't know what that is. I certainly would have to say that if mass attendance was highest as it's ever been in the 1950s, and I mean, I may, you know, maybe off a generation or so, but I'm pretty, pretty sure that's, that's close to fact that, um, 
you know, w- as opposed to where we are now and how we practice our faith now. So even if we were doing it more out of the obligation and out of how, you know, the minimum that the church was requiring, because we are not even doing the minimum. Most Catholics are not even doing the minimum. And so that says a whole lot for me. So, um, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's hard. I, it's hard not to look at the facts of what sectors of the church are growing and which ones are declining. Yeah. And when you look at the Latin, more churches offering it, more people attending it. Now you're, it's going up from a really small percentage. So yeah. that that's important to note versus what what every other church is. You're looking at it at a much bigger number, but the the statistics and the research would say that it's the the more traditional far right conservative side that is is growing where the left is probably dwindling although they have bigger numbers right now so it's like yeah. and and at, and at its core i've always felt a little torn here because when having because i not to be too political but i kind of sit in the middle you know, I, I very much respect and appreciate the reverence and the beauty of the Latin Mass and the dedication from from the churches that are like that. And then at the other side of the coin, I like the music in the other churches, and I like how alive they are for Christ. And uh, so I, I just tend to sit in the middle, but what's interesting is, Jason— the people on the right and the people on the left, they feel like they're so far apart they couldn't even be in the same at sitting at the same table sometimes. Yeah. I was with a priest a few months ago and he didn't even want to talk about you know a church that sits on the left. And I understand it, mm-hmm. but at the same time, this is this is also why one of the reasons why the Protestant Reformation happened in the first place. So we mentioned this was going to be a show that bounced around a little bit, but they are all tied together. So I'm going to throw some things out here that kind of, I think, just as where we are right now, that relate to where we're going. So I heard the other day that the birth rate in the United States is as low as it's been since 1979. And of course, there was a big prediction that uh, during COVID and the quarantine, there was going to be a baby boom, which has not happened. So... So I was, you know, so sitting here, I just have some notes, you know, because these are like, well, well, maybe we talk about this, maybe we talk about that. But if you think about that, and then I'm going to go to three bumper stickers and or T-shirts that I remember from the 1980s. And then I'm going to tie these things together with where we are, (laughs) hopefully. (laughs) All right. All who wander are not lost. You may have seen that one on the back of somebody's car. All who wander, not lost. Okay. Uh, don't follow me. I'm lost. Uh, I've seen that one before, you know, so you know, don't follow that person. And then the last one, we've seen these t- t-shirts with the arrow on it. I'm with stupid. Okay. So <laughs> I'm thinking of these, and I don't know why, but they popped in my head this morning. And so I'm thinking, okay, all who wander, are not lost. If we're ultimately, if we're wandering without a plan, without a goal, without some purpose, we will be lost. But I think all the rebuttal to that is all who wonder are not lost if you're following God. If we're following God, we're, we're in the desert, we're on the mountain, we're following God, we're not just wandering around. We have purpose and intention, we're lis- whispering, listening to the whisper of the Holy Spirit, we're following God. The second, don't follow me, I'm lost. I think that would be relatable to following others. So if we're following God, when we're wandering, we're not lost. If we are lost, that's when we start following others. And then the last one, I'm with stupid. I would say that is when you're following yourself. So when we're following whatever we want, whatever whim, whatever, you know, just makes us happy for that moment, that is following ourselves, and we are just plain stupid. We're not lost. We're not wandering. We're just stupid. So Hmm. tying that with the birth rate, I just feel that man has become stupid. We are hmm. so much following ourselves. And what does that equate to? So if we look at the birth rate, we look at um, another, here's another point I heard on the news. Millennials are the most unhealthy generation, which was a surprise to me because I thought with all the avocado toast and soy milk, they probably would be the most healthy, <laughs> but apparently they're the most lazy. 
because they have all the social media and all the Netflix and everything else that they become the, the unhealthiest. Now, I don't know. I'd have to check, you know, statistics on that and see where it came from. But that's just a, a, a news talking point there. So if we look at all that and we look at the the decline of society since, you know, the 1970s and 80s, which, in my opinion, we have not inclined anything other than technology, perhaps, Um we we want this ease of life. So, you know, this ease of life, this selfish life, we haven't had kids. We're having less kids because we're following ourselves. So how does that equate with the church? We want to follow whatever makes us feel good. If it makes me feel good on Sundays to just, you know, go work in the yard and know that I'm close to God because I'm tilling the land. Well, there's really nothing wrong with, you know, being out in the yard, but I mean, God did command to keep holy the Sabbath. And if we are Catholic, we know that that means participating in mass. So, you know, there's a lot I just kind of took and, and combined. I threw it in the blender. It's a, it's a <laughs> some sort of smoothie here, you know, so what, what, is, what does it taste like to you? I guess it, you know, what it tastes like to me is that, uh, the self the world is telling us right now that serving ourselves in our own interest is all we're here to do. That's what it's telling me. Yeah. And whether you're to tie it back to what we were just talking about, whether you attend St. Matthew's or you attend St. Vincent or you don't attend mass at all, or you go to daily mass at St. Gabriel's. I, it, it, to me, it's like the question is, are you only serving yourself or are you here to serve the Lord? And I vehemently believe that there's that there are faithful Catholics at St. Matthew's that are vehemently serving the Lord every single day with all of their heart and all of their might. And I know there's people at St. Patrick's doing it, and I know there's people at St. Vincent doing it. And man, during this season of life with children and the, the world we're raising them up in and these, you know, all the statistics that you just r- r- rallied off, that just cannot be undersold or understated the importance of that because this world will eat you up. Absolutely. It will eat you up and it'll start to tell you that God's not important or that Jesus is not important or that, that you're most important and how you feel is most important and your needs being met are most important. And guess what? That is a lie. And man, that message might be tough to hear, but it is the truth. And, and I just, so that's how the blender came out to me. Yeah. So, I mean, another side of that is, and I, and I think that maybe, the church needs to maybe step up and and kind of regularize and and um, you know uh, not allow such different. I mean, the church is. I mean, we're humans, and you know, we're 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 uh, we're you know, God is infinite, and He's created us in an infinite manner. That you know, we're not all the same. I, I understand that. There's different. Um, ways of worshiping and and not to say that everything needs to be all the same but you know the that that liberal conservative evangelical uh you know kind of different differences there's i don't know there you know we are gonna we are catholic and we are we are unique we're all unique and each church and each parish and each each priest is unique but there certainly has to be something and i don't know what that is i i don't know what that is well i i do know that um life is not fair <laughs> and i don't think god and i don't think we want god to be fair either because if god was fair then we would be in eternal damnation because we're sinners so i don't want god to be fair okay yeah true and and you're 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 born with different gifts and your kids were born different gifts than you are and you've had might have different opportunities than I've had or vice versa and so I'm not looking for an equal playing field like yes idealistically fine but it's not real life no it's true and I I just I I was listening again I've been listening to the Bible here and I just this this jumped out at me in, in scripture God honors those who honor him God honors those who honor him. And I don't know at what capacity, and that's not our job, but just knowing that regardless of what's 
if you're on the more conservative or liberal side, like God honors those who honor him. And I'm not going to be the first to judge someone at St. Matthew's or someone at St. Patrick's because you go to church there, you go to church there. I am going to say that, are you honoring God? Do you have reverence for the sacrament of the Eucharist? Are you honoring him in that way? Are you teaching your kids correctly? I mean, that is more important to me, but I see the, I see the validity on both sides and, um, Man, we went all over the place today, Jason. We we, we covered some ground. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's let's end us in prayer, man. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord our God, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for uh, this forum to come together and express our uh, our thoughts and our prayers and uh, positions as Catholics to, uh, in order to help us grow. Thank you for our mothers, especially for our Blessed Mother in Heaven. And uh, have you know, continue to bless them and allow Our Lady to guide us to our eternal home and uh, continue to make us and guide us to be the men, the father, the husbands that you've created us all to be. In your holy name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.